Hello again. Uh, all right. So we've talked now about, uh, excuse me for a moment. We've talked about uh, uh, databases a lot in this course. And you've now started a homework assignment where what you're doing is, uh, you know, again, you're going to work to connect to a database and, you know, you're going to basically be adding some stuff, deleting some stuff. Um, I actually eliminated the issue of editing stuff there, but that's basically what you're going to do. And, and it's, it's set up in a certain way. Anyways, so you can, we've seen like this basics of being able to connect to a database, to be able to do this from a program, from program actually, and to actually use that database as a store for our program. Um, what next? Well, uh, we're not going to be writing a lot of applications like that going forward. We're going to go to the next stage. We're going to be working on this notion of software as a service. Uh, more to the point, these are web applications, all right? So these are applications that we're going to actually see and run where we've got a web browser and we're going to connect to a server. Uh, we're going to have that server. It's going to have a database. Uh, you know, this is sort of the modern world. Um, and the framework we're going to be using is Ruby on Rails. This is one of the, this is basically the big reason why you need to have learned Ruby. Otherwise, we can't use this framework, can't get this programming done. Uh, the reading that this lecture uh, or this plus some more lecture, depending on how much I can get done in the amount of time remaining in this week, is we're in the software as a service book. This is engineering software as a service. This has been very nicely made available now as a free PDF. The PDF is available in, in Learn. Grab it uh, while you can, uh, although it should stay free forever. Uh, the sections that we're going to cover is now, we're now in chapter three. Chapter one was an overall introduction to software as a service and uh, software engineering. We'll actually sort of touch upon those topics more in 342, our software engineering uh, focused course. Chapter two was all about learning a new programming language. How do you go about learning a new programming language and the programming language of choice being Ruby? That was what we did in week one of the course. Um, and of course, I suggested also reading many, many chapters of Head First uh, Ruby as a really good way to get yourself up to speed and learn Ruby. Um, now we're moving on to chapter three. After doing our uh, many chapters and sort of deep dive into learning how to work with a database, how to design databases uh, using entity relationship diagrams and in our brief coverage of normalization. Um, so we know how to write all this SQL. We know how to starting to learn how do we design them with entity relationship diagramming. We've started to program programmatically access the database. All right, now it's time to go to the next step. Let's start building web applications. Um, so a picture of what we've done so far, by the way. Uh, we've basically been operating all within one computer. So inside of our computer here, so this is our computer, and this could be your personal computer if you wanted, or more to the point, you were working in Codeo. Codeo is a cloud-based service. It's actually, uh, these uh, servers are hosted by Amazon. And so when we go into Codeo and we start a project, basically a, we're given access on a Linux machine running in Amazon's cloud, probably somewhere in Virginia, uh, in the United States. And that's where, you know, we're there, we're lo logged in to that machine across the continent. Anyways, so that's the computer usually, but it could be a personal computer, it could be your phone, anything that's a computer. This is what we've been doing so far, is we have some program that we're writing uh, in Ruby. So some program.rv, for example, okay? And 
We as well, and as traditional, we draw our databases as a cylinder. The idea of the cylinder is it represents what uh, old-fashioned notion of uh, hard drives looked like in the um, data center uh, that we would have at, you know, at large universities and things where or the, or the computer center. Anyways, uh, it's typically, it's the symbol of we've, we're storing data here. It's a database symbol, cylinder. It still means a computer program, okay? Uh, and that computer program then runs within the computer and saves things to the file system and so forth and so on. Now, our programs, as we've been do using them, they programmatically can connect to the database. We are running, we use SQL as our way to query and uh, change that database. And we get back from the database for our program, you know, some rows of data. We're like, select the, from this tab these tables, do this join, all this stuff, and let me see what the rows are. And then our program uses those rows and shows them to the user, lets the user do things with them. And we can do inserts, we can do updates, we can do deletes, anything that SQL allows us and we get back responses from the database. And this all happens within the computer. Now, it's not that hard uh, with the technology to, instead of us saying, yeah, we're gonna talk to the database that's on our machine, when we do the database connect, we can actually go and we can say, actually, there's a database on another machine and I'd like you to go, here's a, an address, a network address of that machine. Here's a port to connect to. Uh, please connect to it. Oh, yeah, I've got a password and login and all that good stuff. And instead, we can have a model, uh, which is this sort of more traditional idea that we have some sort of client. We have a server. And we go and our client is running on one machine. The server is another machine. And on our client is our program. And on the server, it's hosting our database. All right. Uh, hosts our database. And likewise, we can still make our queries to it and we can still get our rows back from it. Um, this could be our personal uh, PC now and that's our server. Uh, but there can, buy, there can be lots of machines out there that have our program. We, you know, we can give all, lots of people this code and they can run this Ruby and it can connect and get results back. So this is the classic uh, client server. Uh, there's a notion here that there's two tiers. We have a tier here, we've got a bunch of machines and they can connect to the server, the database, and they get back uh, their results. And, you know, this is, this is really classical. Uh, this is, you could envision this being, you know, what we would have had in the past when we would have we would have talked about like you can think of these as you know like your automated teller machines each one of these is basically a computer and it's connecting over some sort of uh, communications network to some centralized server for the bank all right uh we could envision these as terminals at the airport uh where the airport uh reservation agents are working you know and they're banging on the keys and they've got these screens they they these screens that they work on i don't know if you ever peeked at them they do not look like web pages okay these are systems that were built in the 70s okay and they've maintained the software and they basically are connecting to some large mainframe computer which is running a database um and so this is really uh, from that era, you know, 70s, 80s, so to speak, uh, the client server. This is characterized in particular with uh, basically the client has 
lots of logic or code, so to speak. All the brains is in the software that we distribute to each of these clients. All right. The server is largely just the database like we know. Uh, sure, we've made our tables. We've got, uh, you know, all sorts of nice integrity constraints and other sorts of things. But this is largely the idea is this, this is a centralized repository of our data. But all of our business logic here is, are on these programs, which are run on, on people's computers or the terminals or whatever we wanted to call them. Uh, and in fact, if they actually were terminals like they were in the past, that, it, that actually maybe perhaps would be a little bit more like the, the 70s, maybe the 80s was more, 1980s were more computers. Terminals would be sort of an intelligent way to connect and actually talk to the computer here. You're like, why are you telling me about things from ancient history? Exactly. I agree, without a doubt. Who cares? Um, but this is where things work. This is basically what you've been doing at the moment. Yes, we glued them together and we had it sitting and running on one computer. But what you're doing is a, you're writing code here to talk to the database. You only have two tiers. Whether we run a program and another program on the same computer or we separate them with a network, you know, that's just that's just for convenience or for sharing of resources and so forth. Uh, even when we move on to our web development and we do our three tiers uh, instead of two tiers, when we do the development, we're all going to have it fit on the same computer on Codio. But then we're going to deploy our applications to a cloud-based service known as Heroku. And Heroku will actually run uh, some of the data on one machine. It'll run the database most likely on another machine. And then any web browser in the entire world can be able to connect to our system and use our web app. And that is pretty cool. So let's talk about that now in more detail. Um, by the way, this is all possible to have multiple people connecting again because the database is designed for all of this concurrency. It has all these asset properties. It's, it's, it's what allows everyone to be connecting with the transactions and so forth and manages all of that for us. Uh, this, this issue of how could we have multiple clients connecting and dealing with the data all at once. So that was a, that's a big leap. Without the, the database and its transactions, uh, getting to that stage of building systems would have been very difficult. So that was a major step. Let's talk about three-tier architectures now. Let's talk about web applications. So what we have here is we're going to be dealing with uh, some notion of, you know, this could be, your, again, someone's personal computer, your laptop, your phone, whatever it is. All right. And on that, are, there are a bunch of programs that are going to run. But the uh, one that we care about is the browser. And so it's a program that's been written. So this is when I say browser, this is Google Chrome. This is Apple's Safari. This is Mozilla Firefox and so forth. OK. Um, so this program is here and you got you go and you're like, I really want to go and visit www.uwaterloo.ca you type that in to the browser and you hit submit and what it does is it looks at that what url that you've typed in that address and it forms a http request all right and http this is stands for hypertext transfer protocol i gotta say that's the coolest name in the world all right and what it does is it goes you know 
embedded in that URL that you typed, what you gave to the computer was the name of a network host. It's a way of accessing and saying, I want you to go over the internet and I want to talk, I want to make a connection to this machine. It is entirely similar to, I have a phone number and I'm going to put this phone number in and I want you to dial and get that other person who's, whoever has that phone number to like ring their phone and pick it up and talk to me, please. All right. Now, so you do, you basically, you're like, I want to talk to this other machine and you establish a connection. Again, it's just like you've ringed them with the phone. They pick it up and they're like, hello. And it's this transfer protocol, which is the way that you speak. You know, we talk in English or whatever human language we have. The transfer protocol is actually really simple. It's sending a particular, uh, it, they, they are English strings, okay? And there are things that are making requests for saying, I would like this, please. You know, it's like placing an order, okay? And that goes in and the computer says, oh, okay, well, I happen to know very much when, when I get this type of request coming in, I'm all configured and set up that that is a request that is coming in that's for my web server. And there's a particular piece of code running on the machine, which has registered itself and says, I'm here to answer those requests, please, please forward them on to me. And so the operating system does that. And there are all sorts of web servers in the world. The one we're going to be using is Puma. And so you could think of this request going to the computer and then it gets forwarded on to the web server. And the web server then gets the request. And Puma uh, has as part of it, the ability to uh, plug stuff into it so that you can operate alongside of it. And it, that's where our web framework rails uh, lists exists. So it, it is connected with Puma. So we've got this request in from you saying, I would like this please. All right. And you're talking to some uh, web server over here with that address and it goes to the to the this is the machine this is the actual program running on that computer and these programs are talking to each other and it's in rails i don't know why i drew such a big gap between <laughs> these things it's in rails uh that this is where we write some of our code okay and i'll come back to that but basically this request comes into puma hands it off to Rails. Through the way that we configure Rails, we go, oh, you, you want that. And that causes some code that we have written to run. Much like what you have been writing when you write your Ruby program to connect to the database. And so the idea is, and this is why I realized I did not leave space here. I really want to, I'm going to fix this drawing for you. Uh, I don't need to use so much space for the web server. Although now I'm not drawing it as nicely. All right. Connects to Puma. The request from Puma goes into Rails. Now, Rails is where there's a ton of code, and we're going to write a little bit of code. And we've got it set up again that this request makes it to us and we go, hmm, based upon the nature of your request, I would like this function that I've written in Ruby to run. So based upon all sorts of different requests, we could choose to have different pieces of code to run. Much like what you're doing in the homework uh, five right now, where you're like, oh, I'm going to run, you know, this time I have it as separate programs to do separate things, but you could think of those as ways to make requests into a server to ask you to do things. And so for different requests, you run different code to do things with the database. And so you go and yes, of course, you send just like you've done before, 
your SQL queries over to your Postgres database. And this, by the way, uh, can live on whatever machine it wants, just as we showed before. Um, and, and then we get back from it, we get back some rows. We process those rows and we go, oh, okay, great. Well, now we know that. And then we send back via Puma, uh, actually what it is that we would like to send back to the user, okay? What we usually want to send back is some HTML. So that's what you've seen in lab so far, this hypertext markup language. So we format some HTML. This is basically a big string of special characters, as you've seen, that say how to lay out a page to make it look nice. And Puma goes then and sends that back to the web browser. So what comes back is an HTTP response. So we get requests and responses. A response is composed of, in our case, it'll always be HTML, so hypertext markup language, plus a response code. And we'll, you can talk about those codes, but basically, uh, if we're sending back HTML, usually what we're sending back is also a code that says, oh, everything worked out just fine. Don't worry about it. Um, but we can send back different types of responses as well. Now, so this gets back and it gets into the browser and the browser goes, oh, I thank you very much for all that nice HTML. It then renders, it displays that in the screen for you. And you get to see, for example, like the homepage of uh, www.waterloo.ca. And then the browser, for all intents and purposes, it doesn't necessarily always do this, but basically it's important that you think that it works this way. It hangs up the connection. It says goodbye, and that's it. So the server gets these requests in, based upon the request, figures out which code we want to have run. We run our code, we do our queries against our database, we get our results, and we send them back to be displayed for the client in the browser. And then the client says goodbye, and that's the end. So it's a series of requests and responses that form the communication back and forth. Tier one, two, three. Well, this is why it's a three-tier architecture. Now, what has changed from our two-tier architecture? This browser, while it is a very complex and fancy piece of software, it itself doesn't ship with any business logic. So it's not as though Google and Microsoft, when they make the web browser, embed in it all sorts of intelligence about how to talk to your bank. They don't know any rules about banking. They don't know anything about airline reservations. They don't know anything about making friends on Facebook and so forth and so on. All they know how to do is create requests, receive responses, and display that HTML to you. They're basically, it's like, oh, that's all I'm good for. I can generate a request and I can show you the pretty images and words and lay them out nicely for you and let you interact with it then, which then will generate new requests, which get you new data and I update the page for you, okay? But it doesn't have the logic, all the business logic that we're gonna talk about and deal with, it lives over here. It lives in the code that we write that connects into Rails. This is where we put our business logic and as well, then we're storing our data in our database. Now, you might wonder why, why go to this trouble with regard to the, you know, this setup. One of the things to keep in mind is most commercial uh, large uh, web systems don't have just a single web server. They actually can have multiple web servers running on multiple computers, and all of those computers can then be connecting to uh, the database uh, yes, the database can eventually become a point of contention, but when your database becomes the point of contention and sort of is slowing down your website, 
You should smile because it means you're highly successful and you're probably on your way to riches. Um, so that's a good problem to actually have. It would be bad if, it, if this was a point of contention because you're a horrible programmer, but we're not going to believe that to be the case. We're going to believe that you are an excellent programmer and it's just that you're getting tons and tons of business. All right. The beauty then is we can have businesses set up these, all right, and they get to build them all, they're all in-house, and this is effectively something that they don't have to worry about. They don't have to ship the program to everyone to install for themselves to be able to connect to my bank or my airline or my uh, Facebook, whatever. Oh, no. They just need to have this general purpose browser to be able to make these requests back and forth, back and forth. And an amazing thing actually happens then, which is, oh, I want to, I, I found a bug. Well, just go uh, fix the code, fix the bug. And then every user out there in the world gets to experience the new improved software instantaneously. We don't actually have to say, uh, we'd like, we'd send them a piece of mail, a piece of paper mail. We have a new update to our software. We recommend that you go to the nearest store and pay us money to buy a physical piece of media, like a floppy disk or a CD-ROM, and please install that into your computer and update your client so that you can have the new business logic because we had bugs in it. And then you'll be able to talk to our server and so forth. Uh, that's the way it used to be. No more, all right? This is, this is beautiful. Everyone can have their computers. They can talk to these servers. And now you get to see where this title of that textbook, Software as a Service, comes from. So instead of selling you software that you install on your computer, now all these businesses do is they simply run a service and you get the software as a service. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing and you can see it today, you know, with the web and everything where. And I know. Most of you probably were born in this century and not in the last century. Um, and as such, you've experienced the, the modern age of the web for your, most of your life, basically. And I really mean the modern age, where this model that I have here is actually a little bit out of date. Now, we are not going to go past this model in 245 or 342, but there is one shift that has been happening um, and is responsible, responsible for a huge amount of uh, some of the fancier applications that you see on the web, which is that in the browser, so you make your request in here and it runs and it does all this. And in addition to sending back HTML, you also send back a large amount of computer code, uh, usually in the form of JavaScript. Then these browsers have become so sophisticated that they run the JavaScript in them. They become interpreters of computer code. And that computer code runs while you have that, that web page open. And that computer code can go and now behave a little bit more like we used to have, which is it can, as you interact with it, it can make requests back and forth. And it can even hold open a request and talk back and forth over that open sort of you know, network connection, or if you wanna think about like a telephone call again, they can do that. So what this has done is it's sort of blurred some of the lines, so to speak. Now, there is a mixture of logic that ends up in the browser with our JavaScript and logic that is on our uh, second tier. So there's been a shift of it. But even so, almost without a doubt, all the big computation, all the big amount of data always lives over here. It's only the lightweight, I'm trying to do, I'm doing something that's gonna change the interface that lives over here. 
But any time that I really need to deal with uh, asking for uh, some sort of important computation to happen, that goes over the network and we do it over here. And just think about it. it's 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 like dealing with a web search. You know, so you go to Google or you go to Bing. They've crawled the internet. They have billions and billions of web pages and hundreds of thousands of computers to do the web search for you. That's not that's not that's not like let's ship it to you and have it there. Now sure, they're going to send quite a bit of javascript and they're going to do cool things. It's like your Gmail. They can do all sorts of stuff in Gmail. Your email still lives at Google, but they can send you a fair amount and have this be a very interactive experience such that you are not necessarily aware that there's a whole bunch of request and responses, request and responses. Under what we will do in the course, uh, we are going to experience absolutely 100% the sensation of I make a request, code runs, a response comes back, and it's really clear to you when you're running your system in the browser that that's the way it's working. Now, we do this for what we call pedagogical reasons. So, in other words, this is a good way to learn and get used to this system. And you might go, oh, no, come on. I want to do like the, the modern super cool thing. And the issue is, is that's a whole nother level of complexity. First, we have to deal with this level of complexity. And there is a lot here for us to digest and understand. So it's not, it's not as simple as we might want it to be, to be like, yeah, let's just transport ourselves to the modern era and also, hey, let's learn another computer programming language this term. Let's add JavaScript to the mix and a whole other slew of technologies, one step at a time. Let's get through 242, sorry, 245 and then 342. And then, you know, on your spare time or in your co-ops, yeah, start picking up these other technologies and be able to do these new fancier setups. All right. So that's the lay of the land. That's what we're going to do. Uh, the next stuff that we're going to talk about then is to really sort of to, to dig deeper into individual parts. All right.